Hello people. Okay, this is a video I wanted to do for a while. If you follow a certain character called Mr. Carlson's Lab on YouTube, then you'll know that he um, has invented quite a, a number of fantastic pieces of test equipment, which are these things here. There's a capacitor tester and a forecasting and uh, a foil side detector for capacitors. Great stuff, but you've got to make the circuit boards. I mean, you, you can't buy them. So if you follow him on Patreon and you pay your monthlies, you will get the circuit uh, diagrams and component lists and all you need to know to make it. So for a lot of people though, making their own circuit boards is a, is a, they think it's a bit of a dark art, but I want to say on this piece of junk here, you can turn out perfect circuit boards, no joke, every single time. So even double-sided ones. So, what I'm going to explain, uh, this I bought this uh, laminator off eBay, it was, uh, I think it was 10 quid. It's actually disgusting, I mean I couldn't see from the photos when I bought it that it's actually yellow with nicotine and it stinks like somebody smoked 60 a day. So it's quite, it's quite a revolting thing to be near. Um, anyway, I opened it up to see what was going on inside. I bought this one because it was a foil uh, laminator and I presumed possibly correctly that it runs hotter than a standard laminator when you have it on the foil setting. What I needed to do was tweak these two pots to turn them up so it stays on all the time. i just got to be mindful that I'm not going to burn it out but this thing doesn't run hot enough to to pop its clogs really. So that was just a little tweak of mine. Don't do that if you, if you um, don't feel that's a good thing to do but I was necessary to get the heat up on this thing because it was just a bit cool. So on a better laminator you'll get heated rollers heated silicon rollers and that's got to be a superior mechanism this thing is an absolute brute but what I want to prove the point is that you couldn't get any worse than this really and I think I can show you well I've done it many times that you can make perfect circuit boards even on a pile of crap like this which is great so I'm just going to put this to one side and um, I'll start at the beginning which is we've got to start we've got to cut out our um, traces so we're going to be doing this on very very good quality laser printing paper so this is not inkjet it, it does not work because because that's ink we're going to be doing this with uh, laser which is a toner so that's thermoplastic so what you see in the black there is a the thermoplastic and we're going to put that we're going to put that onto the copper we're going to make it stick by sticking it through the laminator and that's the relatively tricky bit cleanliness Good quality printing, extremely good quality in the right paper is vital to get this thing. Even though this is rubbish, getting the paper and the the uh, the contrast good. When you when you're printing this out, make sure that you've got it on the best contrast. You can have the blackest blacks, which just means there's more black more um, plastic being put onto the paper. So that's it for now. I'll move all this and I'll get the chopper and I'll get on with it. Right, this is the paper. So, as you can see, it's Hewlett Packard Professional Laser Photo Paper. It's 200 GSM, uh, 100 sheets. And this was reasonably expensive. I can't remember how much, but it, it wasn't the cheap stuff. Um, it, it's called glossy, but uh, in actual fact, if you look at the paper, it's erring on the side of satin or eggshell, more so. I think laser and inkjet have different categorizations in what they would determine what was glossy and what wasn't. Anyway, this is the one that I found that actually works. It's quite happy to give up its uh, toner, very important. Quite happy when you put it under the tap to start to fall to bits, which is very important. You don't want something that's so glossy that it's almost waterproof. So this stuff's awesome. Um, and it holds lots and lots of toner. So I keep this in a sealed bag all of the time. Um, just for obvious reasons. Anyway, if you're going to get dust and stuff on here, the printing won't work very well. Uh, so if uh, I don't have a, a laser printer, I took this to the professionals up the road, and I asked them to. I, ha I took the sheets out and put it in a sealed bag, and asked them to be as dust-free as possible. So any tiny little dust motes under the print, all those things will will hinder our results. So. Cleanliness is absolutely next to what's itness. This thing here, the guillotine, 
I always give this a wipe down with uh, isopropyl alcohol or something of the nature to get rid of all the dust off. You have to be really clean here too because you're handling the paper. So rule of thumb, do not touch the paper with your fingers, just touch the edges. And uh, this is you know, any oil from your fingers on that black toner and it's not going to stick, it's just going to come off in the ferric chloride. So really clean, be really scrupulous about your paper, be, you know, absolutely as clean as you can. That's all I can say if you want it to work out. Because I've, I've done this in, in practice a long time ago. I, I made these mistakes not thinking it mattered enough and, and it's, it mattered a lot. So anyway, that's those. Let's move that aside. Yes, and this is my clean bench for now, so I'm trying not to move around too quickly. So what we need to do is I'll keep these in the, those little sealed bags as well. So I'm making sure that I don't touch anywhere where there's toner. So I'm just going to cut this down to size. I'll do some show don't tell here for a minute. it having a good quality guillotine helps but you can do it with a Stanley knife or, or a, you know a decent rate a blade uh, with a straight edge of course you don't have to have a guillotine so that so that's it you need to cut out your circuit board now so you need to make the circuit board just a bit bigger than your paper. So I'm just going to go and do that. I cut these boards out with a hacksaw. It's the easiest thing to do. So something important here is when you um, cut these edges, even though I've linged them afterwards, you have a very sharp burr on, on both sides in fact, because it being fiberglass and, and if you haven't thought of it already, the other areas of problem are the corners. So just take a little rounding off that we're going to be sticking this through the laminator in all sorts of different angles. So these nasty little sharp bits are also areas of concern. Just gave that a quick hoover on there. Yeah, you never know, Mr. C might be watching himself, so I better do it right. So the next thing is I've got to prepare the circuit board surface. And as it comes from the factory, um, it has a lot of little marks and what have you. It's also quite important to note when you choose your bit of board, that just have a look to see if there's any dints or dings, because a dint or a ding, the plastic won't, it can't span it, it won't go into the hole, even though it's microscopic, and that means one of your traces could well not be connected. So that's quite important. Um, on the list of most important things to do, this next stage is very important, and that's cleaning the surface. So if you go along the drain, I don't know what grit this is, 320. Wet and dry. When you're doing this, try try to keep your pressure going all the way to the edge and off, all the way to the edge and off. Otherwise, you'll end up with a hollow. Try and keep it as even as possible. Do it in one direction if you feel more confident like that. Because it's quite easy to dig a hole in this stuff. Because soft copper is very very soft. All right, that's the. Um, the coarse sanding done. So what I want to do now, I've got some 1200 grit here. This is wet and dry again. You can use it wet if you wish, but dry as the name suggests, wet or dry. 
So that 320 grit's left quite a lot of striations and marks and things. I don't know if you can see them in the lens. Maybe. Uh, we need to take those down because if you can imagine the plastic, uh, if the ridges are too deep or too severe, the plastic will microscopically it'll look like it's trying to ride a load of ruts in a road. So we want to take that down and have this as flat as we can, um, but we still need to leave some uh, area of grip, even though we won't be able to hardly see it after the 1200's gone on it. So that's good. So I don't need to clean that just yet. I'll do that just before we stick it through the laminator. So now what I've got to do is fire the laminator up, get it up to speed. I'll just turn it on. Yeah. That's as loud as it gets, you hope. So let's watch these um, figures go up. I think we're getting pretty close. So what I need to do now is get my paper, clear the decks up a bit. So I use disposable towel and I use some isopropyl alcohol which seems to be the best no zero residue solution. Now just be careful not to do that over the hot platen, you don't want to set fire to the joint. Cleanliness, so so important at this point. It's looking pretty clean. So now what we're going to do, must be remembering not to touch the paper at all. So that, put that down there like that. Before that you could give it a quick blow if you want, but careful not to put any uh, moisture on there. That's certainly the enemy. So as you can see now that my board is just a bit bigger than the cutout. Can you see that? Just a bit bigger. Right, 150 degrees, right, that's great. That'll do. Let's take that out. Now, the, the monstrous thing about this laminator, you actually have to push the thing down a bit. This thing could never have worked properly. I, I looked at it, I thought, gosh, is it damaged? It's just a rubbish design. So you'll, you'll see what I mean when I put this through. So you pinch it like that, get it in there, don't let it slip. Push it under the platen. If this was a, a heated roller one, the rollers would take it on. I've got to push it under very carefully until it bites the rollers. Fingers crossed. So you hope it's hot enough from this. Look at that rubbish. Look at that. Some bit of dead fly or something that's got in there. Right, so if you noticed, that ain't coming off. Yeah, that's a bloody dead fly. Look at that. Oh, gross. So, what you need to do now is get it going. Just do it, turn it around the other way around, just carefully. Still keeping your thumbs on the paper till it bites again on the roller. Let it do its thing. So we're not in a rush with this. It's not a game of speed, this is uh, just a game of uniformity. So now, do it on an angle. This board's getting quite hard to hold now. That's a good thing, that means it's been nice and hot. So the point of doing it in all these diagonals um, it's probably fairly obvious, but it's just each way you do it, if there's, because it, nothing's perfectly flat. So this allows discrepancies 
to, to get their fair share of getting flattened and heated. That's just pretty damn hot that. <clears throat> So for a nasty little laminator, this gets nice and hot after you turn them up. Because when I first got this thing, it was, it was, it was pathetic. That's good. I'm just going to cool this board down because it's stupid hot. Put it under there like that. And the, um, the board uh, will conduct the heat into the surface of the workbench and cool it down quick smart. Just move it somewhere again. Perfectly handleable from something stupid hot to cool as you like. So I'm going to take that into the kitchen now and show you uh, the, the, the magic unveiling. Right, so we want the uh, water to be on reasonably warm. We're not scalding, or certainly not too hot. You can't touch it because you don't want that plastic to uh, come undone. So sort it out. There you go. So, let it run under the stream. And what I was saying about earlier about you don't want paper that's so glossy it's waterproof. You see it's starting to change colour around the edges now. Needs to absorb the moisture. So that's coming down a bit. A bit crazy. Start to see the circuits uh, coming through now. You can start putting your fingers on there and giving it a bit of a rub, but not too, not too violently. It just helps push the water in. paper is going to want to come off on its own accord, you don't want to be uh, forcing or tearing it off. There will be some residue left on there, but we'll, we'll get that off with a toothbrush in a minute. So I'm just going to get that on the bottom of the sink and just find this toothbrush. a good sign. Let's put that a bit closer. The little alignment corners on the circuit are perfectly intact. So without further ado let's see if I can show you this. Yep, it seems to have stuck nicely. A bit more water. No rush in this, no rush at all. That residue that's uh, on the back will come off with a toothbrush, I'll show you in a sec. But we want the bulk of it to come off freely and on its own accord. When I first saw this being done, I thought, oh, that's so magic. I, when I was a young boy, I used to have a thing called a Darlow pen. I don't know if you can still buy them. You actually manually <laughs> write on the board with this Darlow pen as your acid resist. When I saw this, I thought, I've just got to make some circuits. 
Let's see what's going on now. Yeah, it's looking good. Let me show you. Oh, I love that reveal. That's the coolest thing. I was going to tease this last bits of paper off. And if you've done your job correctly, you can, you know, I'm going to show you in a second, you can get a toothbrush on there, you ain't going to pull any tracks off. Uh, that's the full toothbrush. Pretty damn fine, you can see all, all four corner markers are there. So now what I like to do is get a soft toothbrush and just get all the Mickey Junger off. It's a thing of beauty these things, I mean they're works of art. All thanks to Mr. Carlson, of course. Just the copper and the black uh, makes for a very fine looking thing. Right, that's as much as I need to do. What, what I'm wanting to do is make sure that I haven't got any paper in between the tracks. So where all the fine tracks run, just make sure there's no paper in between. It doesn't matter if you've got this white coating from the paper on there, that's just that's all going to disappear in the ferric chloride. So that's 100% success right there. So we've got a ways to go yet. The proofs in um, how well this is adhered to the copper is um, what, what happens to it in the ferric chloride. So first thing I want to say uh, is about the equipment you're going to need. I recommend a, uh, a pair of tongs. And I recommend wearing some gloves. I haven't got any gloves um, handy, so um, I've done this before and I'm going to be very careful, but if you haven't handled ferric chloride before, get some gloves. It is the nastiest stuff. It's not because it's going to burn you to death. It's not like nitric acid. Although if you get it in your eyes, you'll, you'll regret it. But it's getting it on your hands, it stains. It's like nothing else. It stays there and it actually is, it becomes indelible into your skin. It does not come off. Uh, plus it doesn't come off on stainless if you if you splash it into some stainless or aluminium the acid it, being an acid it etches itself into the surface and it doesn't come out and even a pot sink like this it will leave a tide line walking around the thing it's horrible so if you are going to do it in a pot sink and handle any ferric chloride uh, in well you don't want to get it in the sink but if you actually get it splashed just have some running water in there and it will dilute it and take it away so the ferric chloride itself this is a, a new batch now it lasts for years really i mean if you look at the, this is 40 percent ferric chloride if you look on the the drum that you buy it it'll, it'll give it an expiry date but my experience it doesn't uh, go off if, as long as it's sealed tightly so what i do uh, if you have it cold like this the, the acid etching process takes a long time so I heat it up in the microwave, not very carefully. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this. The other alternative is to do it in a pan of water. And you sit the pan in, you heat that up on the stove and get it hot that way. But um, for me, I just want to get, get on with it. So I'm just going to heat up this ferric chloride in the microwave, not with the lid on, we don't any anything like that. And I'm not going to keep it on for very long. I just want to get to a certain temperature so I can get some speed up. So I'm just going to do that. That, I don't know if you can see the little bit of steam coming off. You don't want any more than that in the house because it stinks. And I always do this process under the extractor. So that was uh, 50 seconds in, in a 900 watt microwave. No more. Doesn't need it. But it just gets on with it. So I'm just going to stick that in the pan. So this is an induction hob, um, so I'm going to put it on fairly high to start with. 
So the water line is about the line, same as the line of the ferric chloride. That's ideal because if you've got the ferric chloride higher, it's not getting heated evenly. But you don't want this roiling away like a fool. It just needs to be nice and gentle. So just let it get up to speed a bit. That's hot enough. And then I just keep it down to about a number, what, let's say number three, something like that. So it's nice and warm. So here's the board. So I don't go dropping it in with my hands because if it splashes out, it's going to get me, especially with no gloves. Look at that. Just fits, hey? Get it in. Right, I'm just going to rinse these tongs under some running water. So. So, can't stress it enough that stuff is foul and it'll ruin your kitchen it'll just ruin and if, if you're not the boss in the kitchen you you're going to be in deep deep shut <laughs> deep stuff if you get splashes around the place so if you've got an outside area you can do this all, all the better but just to be mindful that it uh, it is a chemical and it's not a common everyday chemical that you might be used to handling this is um Something that is literally dissolving the copper away. Not before our eyes, because we can't see, it's a shame. But uh, I'm just going to stick the lid on a little bit. And then I have to stick the extractor on. And we'll just have to dial down the noise. Right, I'm going to stick a, a timer on so you can get an idea how long this takes. Sometimes it's a good idea to give it an agitation, just gently. It just assures that the liquid doesn't stay stagnant on one place, it just creates a flow, which, and the flow is a good thing because the more flow there is, the more it drags away the particulates and um, put them somewhere else. If you leave it too long, the ferric chloride will eat underneath the traces, and that's what you've got to avoid. And that's particularly um, a point in case if you're using the thicker UM copper boards, there is a risk of the ferric chloride slipping under the trace and eating it away from, from underneath. So I like to just keep it agitating. It definitely speeds it up from practice, it uh, makes a big difference. And this lid, it's a fairly loose fitting lid, it's not a, it's not a brilliant seal, but it's keeping that keeping that gas in there. Just as a matter of interest for people who are wondering how hot the water is. So you can see it's not boiling. This is in the centigrade the Celsius. So it's hovering up and around towards 70 degrees. Right, this is the 18 minute mark, it should be done. So I recommend having a sacrificial stick, like a skewer, something like that, so you can get in there, make it upright, so you give me something with the tongs to grip, gently grab it. You can see right through the board, that tells you it's done. He says confidently, yes I think so. I can't um, stress enough, uh, I honestly don't like doing anything ferric chloride in the house, it uh, gives me the heebie-jeebies uh, from experience of staining and things. So back in the safety of the workshop, it's all good. Anyway, we survived. So I'm just going to dry this off, it's still wet from rinsing it under the sink. And you can see all the traces there intact. I'm just going to get some alcohol.
Et on verra le corps là. Note to self, don't bother with the alcohol, just go straight to dinners. I like using alcohol because it's it's much kinder. The thing is it's such a, a brute weapon. But in this instance it's uh I like its brutishness, so let's have a look. See that? It's all good. So what you do now is the final touch is you linish. So those little um, corner pieces there and there, you just put that on the linisher in just up to that as a neatness on all sides. And Bob's your what's it. Well, I hope you enjoyed those steps. It is actually straightforward. I might have made it look a bit convoluted, but it's not. Um, I'll give it a go. And check out Mr. Carlson's lab as well. Fascinating fella. Very, very interesting. And, um, you know, you can get the the whole workings of this board and, and build something incredible for your workbench for a couple of bucks a month. All right. See you next time.